welcome to the third session of day two of the Telegraph Food and Drink Festival. And it, the title today is Become a Master of Fire with Genevieve Taylor. Uh, my name is Anthony Clay. I'm a food writer for the Telegraph. And I have with me here Genevieve Taylor, author of 10 cookery books, including the best selling Chard, which is, I think, probably about one of the first vegetable barbecuing books. So let's go. So Genevieve, hello, you hello. are a cook, a barbecue supremo, someone who bucks the idea that it's only boys who can barbecue. Am I right? Absolutely. Women light amazing fires and cook amazingly on barbecue because we're really good at multitasking. It just kind of comes naturally to us and you need to be able to do that with fire cooking. But do I need fancy kit to cook not, on fire? Not at all. So behind me, you can see I've got a big um, ox grill kind of Argentinian style perea, which is pretty fancy. It's the kind of designed for professional kitchens. Down here in front of me, I've just got a very flat fire table um, from Netherton Foundry. Really simple, a bit of kit. Both things do the same job. You Could just, I just use a, like a fire pit or something like that? I mean, this is like a fire pit, yeah, for sure you can. Mm. You see the surface to cook on. Uh -huh. The key to good fire cooking is starting with good fuel, because your fuel is your number one ingredient. Are you going to show us how to light that fire? Because I, I am fire so wrong at that. I need help. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if anybody watching follows me on Instagram, they probably would have seen me banging on about how to light fires because this is my favourite way to light a fire. It's called a top-down fire. So you start with big logs at the bottom, then medium-sized logs, then sort of slightly smaller logs, and then onto that you put some kindling like that. So it's turning fire lighting on yeah, its Yeah, because I thought you started by building fire. a little tiny fire with little bits of paper and kindling. I mean, certainly you can do that. That is one way to light a fire. Um, this is by far, I think. So it's like upside down. Light a fire. Upside down fire. So then one of these little things, it's a natural fire lighter. So you can just buy those at hardware shops and things. Yeah, hardware shops. I've even seen them in the supermarket. You can get them online. What about a regular one fire lighter, one of those white things? Well, I, re I, I try to avoid mm. using any chemicals in the fire light. So this is this is a very natural fire lighter. I mean, those things will do the job, but if you've ever touched one of those and smelt your hand... Not what you want on the old really fucking squash. Not, I don't think so. And these these things light much better, um, I think. So then we just light that. Um, you can use a match. I've got this little gassy thing here. Because sometimes matches go out in the wind. It's not windy today, but... And then that little fellow goes on top and that's pretty much it. And the reason I like fires like this is because as a kind of busy cook, I can do that one match, light the fire lighter, and then I can step away, go back into the kitchen, sort of do all my chopping and get my prep organized. Um, I think that's one of the keys to kind of good outdoor cooking is getting all of your prep done. You don't have to keep going inside and outside. You know, you're all here, you're all ready. I've got everything I need. Um, I can just stay outside and kind of be in the moment. So it's as easy as that. So if I like that, I It's as easy as that. You're not gonna have to you, so it's as easy as that. I'm not gonna have to stand over that and feed it or anything. Wow. No, the theory is now we walk away, we're gonna go up here now actually and um, and good. do some cooking. Um and we we'll, we'll come just Perfect, because we've got Jessica Flint asking, how long should the fire take to settle down and be ready for cooking? Well, it very much depends on your wood. You know, if you're starting with really good kiln dried timber, which I recommend you always do, um, wet wood mm. is always going to make a sulky fire. So this is good. Uh, this is kiln dried open beach, um, about 15% moisture. I anticipate about 40 minutes probably. So we probably won't do much cooking on this fire during this session. I just really wanted to show you the way that I light a fire because it's a really beautiful thing. Fantastic. And does it, I mean, you say you've got this special kiln dried wood. Could I, I mean, I've got like an old Ikea bed frame. Can I chop that up and use that? I mean, that would be quite green, wouldn't it? No? I wouldn't, 
I wouldn't recommend it, no, because it will have been treated with lots of chemicals. It will invariably be a soft wood. You're always better cooking on a hard mm -hmm. wood because they burn kind of slowly with a sort of nicer heat uh, for cooking on. So, yeah, save the um, save the IKEA bed frame to take to the. Um, <laughs> okay, and uh, with the with the logs that I've got left over, how do I keep them dry? Yeah. How do you keep your logs dry? Well, I just store mine up in. Do you get them in plastic um, or? The garden and then. No, no, just okay. stack them in the shed. So they they need to be able to so I wouldn't put them in plastic. So breathing is good. Ooh. I'm just gonna get the Sorry. camera up here because this fire looks a bit sticky. I just wanna have a little look at it. So we um, <laughs> so we're keeping cooking. Yeah, so I laid um I laid a fire in here that's a mixture of um I can tip it back a tiny bit. That's it. So it's a mixture of charcoal and wood. Um, the reason I use both is that charcoal uh, burns two to three times hotter than wood. So that's why we cook on charcoal, because it's very consistent and it's very even. It's, it's kind of a, it provides a more regular steady heat, providing you're using good charcoal. Um, I'm going to lower that just down a notch so we can see what we're doing. Yes, yeah, so charcoal, um, I'm a real advocate for sustainable British lumpwood charcoal because it's a very positive um, it's a very positive thing for the environment, making charcoal kind of in terms of woodland management and biodiversity. Um, but not only that, as a cook, mm -hmm. it's a very pure product. Mm -hmm. so it, you're gonna and when would you add the charcoal to the fire if you've made your wood fire like you did just now? So this wood, this fire on the floor isn't really mm. designed for charcoal, it's just for wood really. Sometimes I would put a bit of charcoal in there if it was sulking a little bit and I wanted a bit more heat. Um, this, um, this kind of setup is designed for wow. a mixture of wood and charcoal. So, so good charcoal is 95% pure mm. carbon, uh, inert substance, so you should. I've got some charcoal here to show you. Um, this is my favourite charcoal, and I wish you could smell it. But if you sniff, if you open a bag of charcoal and you sniff it, you should be able to smell absolutely nothing. If you um, if you open your charcoal and you can smell something, it's not good charcoal because it means mm -hmm. it's got chemicals in it. Um, it's not a very pure product, and with kind of charcoal, I think the purer the product, the better. Um, I'm going to put that back to one side. So, yeah, that's a tiny bit about fuel. I mean, if anybody's got any questions about fuel, you can find me on um, social media and we can, I can talk to you. We'll stick your messages up on the chat board here. As I was saying, people can stick okay. their messages up here and I will, I will ask you in real time. In real time. Well, so what have you got there, Genevieve, on your phone? have got here we're cooking two recipes today from my um cookbook chart one of them is um is corn on the cob uh with um we're going to make a base with coconut cream and uh, a little bit of sugar a little bit of lime bit of mint bit of soy it's kind of like a cambodian base so because these mm -hmm. cobs are in their husk um they're straight on the fire kind of cooking um and then once once the husks are all charred on the outside, I'm going to peel them back. Then we'll start basting them. Because if you're basting mm. them from raw, like raw sweet corn, because the base has got sugar in it, so it would burn. So basically, you get them cooked, and then you start basting. But if you can't get the ones up. in the husk, which is like nature's own foil. Yeah, wrap them in foil. Absolutely. I mean, I I was this was a bit touch and go whether I could get these in husks because it's the end of this sort of season but i managed to find some which is good because you, you'll see when we do it that when you peel the husks back and it makes oh, like nice. a really nice handle to kind of hold on to it so those are just cooking um i'm going to show you this squash so that's one recipe with the sweet corn and then the other one is um Butternut squash kind of stacks, so you grill the squash uh, and then we're going to layer it up with like feta and 
kind of pomegranate molasses and some pomegranate salsa and lots of kind of really good stuff. I'm going to raise this up a tiny bit. It's getting a little bit hot. Now, if I wasn't doing this on your wonderful swanky grill, but, but on the wood fire that we've just yeah. burned, how would I cope with that? Yeah. Is that? Yeah, that's a really, really useful question. So, um, one of the things that I say to people, I'll move that up a bit, is um, obviously on your hob inside, you just turn the knob up mm -hmm. and down to control your heat. Why you don't get that option? So you have to work out a way to control the heat, basically. So with this one, it's, it's really easy. It's a question of raising it and lowering it. So the fire's here. It's obviously cooler here than it is here. So you raise it up and down. Um, on a kind of regular barbecue, like a round kettle barbecue, you only ever put your charcoal up on one side. Well, there's different ways to set it up, but you you create heat zones. So by putting your charcoal mm -hmm. on one side of the barbecue, you put it so you've got your charcoal on one side of the barbecue and nothing on the other side, and then you've got a gradient mm -hmm. of heat from one side to the other. So you move the food further and closer. It's like you've got fire, three hops on, one hot, heat. one medium, one low, and you just... And mm -hmm. you, can, you kind of go between it. I think one of the commonest problems that people have with them with barbecuing is they just flood the whole of their bottom of their barbecue with charcoal, you know, and the whole thing's alight. And then you just got hot. You've got nothing other than hot. You've got no kind of wriggle room to kind of move around, basically. So by um, so this, I control mm -hmm. the heat on a kind of vertical plane. A regular barbecue or a fire pit, you control it on a horizontal plane just by moving the food. Kind of so do you light the fire in the middle and then move everything over to one side? No, I tend to light it on one side. Um, let me show you this here. This is a mm. chimney starter. So like, um, yeah. you see the holes there? You fill it with charcoal and then underneath here you put, so you rest that on a surface. So I just rest it on the grill surface. Put one of those natural fire lighters underneath like that and then pop the chimney on top and what happens is the the oxygen gets sucked through the holes and it whooshes up inside the chimney and you'll get a fire lit in 10 minutes maximum if you're using good charcoal it might happen in five minutes you know it's a very good way and then when you're ready to cook you tip uh -huh. that into your barbecue Bit charcoal, you put it where you want it. So, and if you're doing a mixture of wood and charcoal, like you are there, do you just chip your tip your hot charcoal onto the wood? Yeah, I mean, I sort of arrange the wood a little bit. Um, so we're in this one. If you come a tiny bit closer, you may be able to see. So I've got logs mm -hmm. at the edge here, and charcoal in the middle. Um, the reason for using um. The reason for using a mixture of wooden charcoal, so because charcoal is a very pure product, carbon, as we talked about, it doesn't smoke, mm -hmm. so you don't get smoke with charcoal. So, and sometimes you want smoke, you know, you want those smoky flavours, so the mm -hmm. wood adds the smoke, essentially. Right. Um, and you can put different sorts of wood, which have mm -hmm. slightly different sorts of smokes. Looks fantastic. That's really well there. I'm just moving it around. So, um, back to this squash. So that we're going to make a stack with like um, with lots of good stuff. I think one of my neighbours has started a drill thing. Sorry about that. Um, they obviously didn't get the mono to be quiet. Um, so butternut squash is a really really dense vegetable. It's like properly solid. Uh, so you need to cook it slowly and gently. And actually, invariably with barbecuing, doing stuff slower and a bit more gently is better than so doing you don't want to get charred sausages you know, exactly it's that classic kind of burn on the outside and raw in the middle scenario you know that um that, that people remember yeah. from the i think francis stuff. from south wales was just saying she never gets her husband to barbecue because otherwise it all gets burned yeah. well exactly that yes my darling <laughs> husband is holding the light. 
he doesn't he doesn't really do much barbecue i think I so him. nothing about male barbecuing skills but i do think that the idea that someone who never cooks in the kitchen should be the person to run the barbecue is a bit weird isn't it because actually yeah. it takes cooking skill to run a barbecue it is it is weird yeah and you need to be really like i said at the beginning you need to go task and you need to be flexible you know because actually um can we just move yeah, yeah. yeah. doing really well oh, we couldn't quite hear you just then do you want to speak up yeah sure you need to be flexible with fire cooking because not every fire is the same you know every fire i light is different so the fire I lit yesterday will be different to the fire I light today. And, you know, the atmospheric conditions and, you know, there's a lot of variables there. So you need to sort of think on your feet and change things and adapt if it's not going as you want it and sort of be able to move stuff around. Have you ever had any barbecue disasters? I have. <laughs> well, sometimes, I mean, you know, sometimes, because when you're barbecuing, it's nice to have a glass of wine, isn't it? And sometimes you maybe kind of get a bit carried away. You know, that happens to the best of us. But no, you need to, I mean, I think if you're cooking stuff slightly more slowly, so the terminology we would use in, in kind of barbecue world is direct cooking, which is over mm -hmm. the flame, and then indirect cooking, which is like off to the side of the flame. And if you're doing most of your cooking, and I would say I do probably... 70 80 percent of my cooking indirectly so not over a direct mm -hmm. flame you've got more room for maneuver right. like you're not gonna burn it it's, it's a more gentle process so it's about um just allowing yourself a bit more time and not not trying to rush it over a super high heat and what if your fire just went light well if you start with the kind of good principles of good fuel um it should light there's no reason it shouldn't light um just gonna lower that one more time i mean i'm not saying that it might be several more times because you just, i'm just adapting it but i always say to people at fire school i teach people how to cook with fire um and i imagine like it's going to do that with my fingers here's a triangle if you imagine the fire's in the middle and then on one side you've got the fuel on the on one side you've got the ignition so that's the match or the you know the lighting and then on the other side you've got oxygen so you need all three of those things to be there and lined up if you lose one of those your fire escapes and it goes so, so it's like the oxygen is really really important to get a fire going and i think one of the reasons people find lighting wood fires like this one down here when you start at the bottom and you add bigger bits and bigger bits and bigger bits people often kill fires like that with love because it's so nice to sort of prod and poke and you know and what you what tends to happen then is if you're prodding and poking a fire things collapse and you shut down the oxygen so you lose the right. air gaps right. and then the fire can go out so with this method here i call it a jenga stack because most people can kind of imagine what that's like you know the logs the logs the logs the logs the kindling fire lighter um there's lots of nice oxygen and air gaps running all the way through that stack so you're not going to lose that oxygen so you're almost guaranteed if your wood's not wet that it's going to work fantastic oh i have a question here for nicole mccloyd and she's saying i like the look of your tom where are they from <laughs> this is so funny these tongs like like i know you know what instagram's like don't you Xanthi? you get a lot of messages from lovely people who want to know things um i probably get about six or seven messages a week about these tongs um they're made by a company called napoleon grills and they're a spatula tong so on the bottom it's like a spatula mm -hmm. and on the top it's a tong and they're really good kind of sliding underneath so they're fantastic mm -hmm. for something like a burger um you can just sort of slide it underneath and turn it over brilliant perfect oh you, you mentioned your fire school as well um because you're the founder of bristol fire school so we can all come and learn in your beautiful garden you can yeah you absolutely can yeah you can people can find me online and very easily just look for my name or bristol fire school you'll find me um 
And the reason I did that was because I spend a lot of time going to festivals all summer, not this summer, sadly, but, um, and it struck me that sort of giving demos and talking to as many people as I can, um, that the thing that gets in the way to success with outdoor cooking is knowing about the fire and managing the fire and working with the fire. Um, Cause once you've got that, it's just cooking like anything else, you know, it is simply cooking. So, um, so I, I started fire school to teach people how to do fire better is what they say, you know, once they learn about fire, then that, that equips them with the base skills, right. you know, to have success. And you do, cause actually I'm lucky enough to have been to one of your classes. Um, so I know it's fab. I also know that while it is about the fire, there's a lot of cooking too, and you should definitely come hungry. For sure, there's a lot of cooking. Yes, you know, so I get, we do a bit of fire lighting and, and then we cook. You know, essentially, we spend the whole day cooking a big meal that we then sit down and share. And by cooking and being involved in the process, everybody learns more than if I was just standing here talking. You know, that's the idea. So people come with, you know, roll up their sleeves, they get cooking, I get them lighting fires. and. Yeah, working and also one of the things I love is it's a kind of hands-on opportunity with all these different kinds of fires because you've got the Komodo type uh, barbecue as well, yeah. which is yeah. like Big Green Egg or Komodo yeah. Joe, they're both Komodo Yeah, exactly. I've got those. And then if I <gasps> duck, what, there's my oh, wood fired up. So cool. Yeah. <laughs> you built that yourself, didn't you? Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. It was really hard work, but we... um. It, it, it was good. It's it was really good. Cool. So that just had a little poke with the tongs, and that's kind of um, that's kind of almost ready now to, to top. So I've just got some feta. Um, you may have some of the top. How long have those so been on? Did you have those cooking yeah, before we good. started the session? Mm -hmm. I had them probably for ten minutes or so uh, before we started the session, just to kind of get them going because they do take quite a long time. But one of the, um, <laughs> we have lots of sayings in barbecue world and one of them, <laughs> it's done when it's done, you know, in with fire cooking, we try very hard to encourage people to think about cooking in time, mm -hmm. um, in terms of doneness rather than time. Like I just said that everybody's fire is different. Um, so as a, as a professional recipe writer, it's really hard for me to right. give you a guarantee that you can put it on there and do it for 20 minutes because your fire might be different to my fire. So you're putting cheese on the slices of butternut squash that don't have a hole in the middle. Yeah, don't put them with the holes. So I'm working here on a, um, on a grill surface that's got kind of lovely holes on it. So it's you know it kind of keeps everything in this is a surface i've designed for ox grill but um on regular grill bars you're more likely to lose stuff down the gaps because it's got bigger gaps so yeah the cheese you want to put it on the bits that haven't got um holes in mm -hmm. and then we can put the ones with the holes on top i've got absolutely my hands have got no feeling in my hands anymore, but i just want to <laughs> do it properly so people don't pick it up with their hands I, my hands are so used to the heat ah. so you pop the other bit on top essentially like that and then um so the squash is put it's tender i just want the cheese to um it wasn't a very good squash because i've got it's not i haven't i've got an odd number of slices but never mind um you just want that cheese mm. to kind of start getting warm there's something amazing about Better. It almost turns to like mousse. Gorgeous. So that really lovely kind of texture. So on that, um, we have, I've got, this is one of my favourite things, pomegranate molasses. I'm sure a lot of the people watching may have heard of this. You can get it in supermarkets now. Like this was just from my local Sainsbury's. Um, it's beautiful and sticky. I'm going to try and do this without creating a massive fire. I should have put it in a dish really. I'm just going to brush a little bit of that. It's got a wonderful kind of sweet and sour flavour. Yeah, I missed. I'm just going to brush that a little bit on the surface. And that's a silicon brush, so right? Cooked squash rings. Just a silicon brush. Yeah, they're great because they're kind of heat proof. Um, so I use it a lot. So we're just going to leave those for a sec. 
Um, and then I wonder if you can kind of mosey it down here. A little bit. Okay, there we go. That, that's a good view, isn't it? Um, so I've got some pomegranate seeds. And I'm going to put probably a tablespoon or so of the pomegranate molasses into those, along with um, a little bit of salt and some herbs so i've got some parsley and mint in there and some spring onions so that's um that's just making a kind of lovely oh, fresh amazing. sweet and sour salsa that we, we can put on top of our sort of slices of our stacks of squash so that's one thing uh, i'm gonna put that one back there and then the other thing um I mean, I love um, I love meat on the barbecue, but to my mind, vegetables are infinitely more exciting. If you think about meat, it's quite one-dimensional in its in its sort of texture and slightly its taste as well. But if you think about vegetables, the kind of the mm. breadth and colour and diversity of vegetables, they kind of they excite me a little bit more than meat, although I am a meat eater, but that was kind of why I wrote chard, basically. Um, so the other thing we're gonna top our lovely squash with is some, uh, just some yogurt and some garlic that I crushed, off you go, and some chili. You could leave the chili out if, if, if it's too much, but I love chili, we're big chili fans in this house. Mm. So I'm just gonna mix that together like that. So that's the two things to go on the squash. Um, and then we should probably start thinking about Fantastic. basting the... Um, well, I, just, I just got a question here about um, smokers. Amy Chang, she's got a barrel drum style smoker with a little antechamber for the fuel. But I've never managed to get the temperature hot enough inside the smoking yeah. drum. Have you got any advice? Has it got like a water bucket? Because sometimes those have got a big... Um, a big trough of water. Oh, so we have to wait like for Amy to answer on that one. I'm not sure. Um, um, so if it has, the reason it has the water is to kind of moderate the temperature because the fire heats up the water. And um, as you probably know, water boils at kind of 100 degrees. So it isn't going to get, it's not going to get mm. much hotter than that because the water's kind of dampening it down, essentially. Um, if it hasn't got... Um, if it hasn't got water, it may be that you haven't quite got your oxygen levels sorted um, because um, you maybe need to open your vents a little mm. bit more. I'm just going to peel these, so maybe we'll peel yeah, back. So. Right, you have got asbestos fingers. I have, it's ridiculous. I mean, this is quite hot for me, but it's, um, yeah, it, I don't recommend doing this at home. Don't try this at home, people. <laughs> Do it with gloves on, maybe. Oh, I've got these. I've got these gloves. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Listen, <laughs> they great um, gloves with fingers and everything. Yeah, they're like kind of welder's mitts or leather welder's mitts. I just wish they'd make them a bit smaller. There must be some lady welders out there. They're sort of like massive, flappy things. If anybody's um anybody makes leather gloves out there, make me a small <laughs> pair. So I've got small hands. Right, so we, you know, by having the husk on, you get this kind of really handy That's handle. Oh, Amy's got back and she says, no, it's not a water smoker, unfortunately. It might be down to the oxygen, not having enough oxygen, and also resisting the desire to keep opening the door to check on it. Yeah, no, no, no. So, talking of barbecue frames, we've got another one. If you're looking, it ain't cooking. So, every time you lift the lid, you let all that lovely heat out that you've developed and you slow the cooking. So, um, I haven't got one out here, unfortunately, but the very best thing you can invest in if you're um, for barbecuing is two sorts of temperature probe. One is just a regular kind of thermopen style probe that goes in, mm -hmm. and the other one is on, on, on a wire. So the probe is on a wire, and the monitor of that probe is on the outside of the barbecue. You just sort of oh, I might have one I can show method. people. Yeah, they're fantastic because. Um, I always say a temperature probe, it's like your x-ray eyes to cooking. It allows you to know what's going in, on inside of your meat um, without lifting the lid. Because if you're cooking, it ain't cooking. I've nearly finished peeling these back. 
Have you got a probe? Oh, yeah, look, here, here I've got a probe with a, with a separate yeah. thing. So you, you stick your probe in your meat and then you look at the dial and your dial tells you what the temperature is. Yeah. You'll have it on the outside. That's exactly what yeah. you need. So that's a really that kit. That's thermopen, um, which where the dial stays stuck to that. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly it. And actually, my next book, I'm just writing a book at the moment on meat cookery. Um, so I've gone from vegetables to meat. And and the single most important thing with meat cookery is to invest in a temperature probe, because then you guarantee that you're going to get your meat. How you Is it meat it. on fire, this one? Yeah, it's all about meat and fire. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Right. So what we need to do is I'm just going to slide our squash back a little bit out of my way I can really hear that that's sizzling do you want to come a tiny bit closer and we can see the sizzle oh yes yeah so we've got sizzly squash that's just going to do its thing um and our sweet corn is here I'm now going to drop lower it a bit closer to the fire so if you were working on a horizontal plane you would move the corn a little bit closer to the fire um and we're just going to start basting it so some coconut cream in there which you can't see because it's totally white a bit of soy sauce uh a bit of brown sugar you could use um palm sugar if you had it some chili more chili i like chili and then I'm just going to quickly zest in some juice, not juice, zest, grate in some zest. Do you want to have a quick look at that fire one more time? That is blazing away. Down, 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 down. There you go. Yeah. Beautiful thing, isn't it? I could just sit and watch that forever. So, yeah, that, um, that's worked. So, hopefully, hopefully people can see that a top-down fire is really effective. Um, I have to say, I do get people who are a bit sceptical about it on um, Instagram and stuff, usually men, I have to say. Oh, Cynthia's just asking, could you cook the squash recipe from today on a medium big green egg or would it be, would that be too small? No, that would be fine. Yeah, that would be fine. There's so would you cook it with the lid up on, on your Komodo type grill or would you put it down? No, those those um Kamado style grills are supposed to right. they're, they're designed really to, to cook with the lid down. That's they work most efficient efficiently. And actually I have to say they're the most fuel efficient cooking cooking things I've ever kind of worked with out on outside cooking. They're so fuel efficient, they're amazing. So that little base we made to start to get it over the sweet corn. It smells really good. I wish you could smell it. It's kind of kind of punchy and kind of coconutty and delicious. Uh, there's my tongs. They're here. So you just you just take your time to to kind of work that base in. So the corn is cooked now because we cooked it in the husk. So it's really um, it kind of steamed as it was cooking. You know, it kind of. Cooked. and this base is all about adding layers of layers of flavour. If you put this on too early, you would risk burning it before it was tender. So was the corn pretty much completely done? Sugars in the coconut. Yeah, pretty much completely done. And all we're doing now is adding kind of that zingy little last hit of flavour for the end and caramelising oh, up. Can you just um, remind me, just, just got... Bit. um. Francis asking what the what the lighters are you use? They sort of wood shaving lighters. If you just Google natural fire lighters, so they, they look like this. It's just a twist of um, wood shavings dipped in wax. So yeah, Google natural fire lighters. You can find them absolutely everywhere online. Um, so bigger supermarkets. Um, wood yards, you know, hardware. Oh, and Margaret really is just asking, uh, we just got one of those cob grills because uh, it's just the two of us. Have you any thoughts about cooking on those? I don't, I don't know. Can we ask Margaret what a cob grill is? What does it look like? Is it like an open grill? I've not heard double B. Grill. I don't know if that's a, I think, a brand. Uh, maybe um, Margaret will get back to us on that. 
to the floor. Because there's cob ovens, which are like a type of um, wood-fired oven, like at the garden, but they're made of cob, mm. which is a, a mixture of kind of mud and straw. But I'm I don't think that's... it now. So we'll see if she comes back. Oh, well done. <laughs> the power of Google. Oh, yes, my husband's Googled it as well. Yeah, look, it's got a little lid. Yeah. That looks like a funky little thing. Yeah. Yeah, I like yeah, that. Really cool. Like you can take them on. Yeah, portable. No, great. I mean, I've never, I've, ne I have to say, I've never cooked on one of those. I imagine the principles are the same. Um, my tip for cooking on that would be don't put too much fuel in. Try and work out a way that you can just have a little bit of fuel on one side. Um, it's harder to do that in a smaller kind of barbecue, mm. but you, you will really reap the benefits if you can just have a little fire and no fire so you've got the option to do that direct indirect cooking and just experiment as well because um i kind of always say to people if you if you've got a, bar a dusty barbecue in the back of your garage and you drag it out of the um you drag it out of the garage on two sundays a year when the weather is perfect you know because it isn't perfect is it if you do that Barbecuing is always going to be a little bit kind of stressy and um, and give you a little bit of fear, I think, because like like anything, the more you practice, the better you get. And then, you know, every time you kind of cook on fire um, and you have a little bit of success, that kind of fuels you for the next time. And then, you know, you will get incrementally better and better as you get more confident at it. And actually, I was just thinking on a slightly chilly day like today, it's probably quite nice being over a nice, warm, cosy barbecue. It's amazing. Yeah. And I think I'm a real kind of summer person. I mean, the, the, I love the summer. I love the heat. I love the sun. And I'm convinced that one of the reasons I do this job is because it keeps me warm at this time of year. You know, if I was inside feeling miserable and dark, whereas this, I'm outside, I'm getting my vitamin D, you know, I've got all that fresh air, but I'm warm. It makes me so happy you know that's why i do it and it's about um it's about like having a tiny adventure as well and i think at the moment i mean this summer barbecuing has become massively popular because we've all been very limited in the adventures we can have haven't we but it's 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 injecting a tiny bit of adventure in your day-to-day -day cooking i mean i'm a working mum i have to feed my family um if I can come and do it outside and turn it into adventure for myself, um, that's going to make me happier than just sort of slogging over the hob in the kitchen. I know it doesn't make everybody happy. And I, you know, <laughs> occasionally I dare to read the comments of the articles I've written and people are saying, oh, I've got a perfectly good kitchen. Why would I go outside? It's like, that's fine. You know, that's fine. 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 But probably, probably don't watch your Instagram, you know. Yeah. You know, I love being outside. I, I am happier outside than I am inside. So. Well, we love that you're outside, Genevieve, showing us how to do it properly. Actually, when you have your fire school, it's all outside, isn't it? So, yeah, we you... Have, you have a look at that. Ooh, nearly oh. Have a look at that sweet corn now. It's looking oh, really yeah. and lovely. Delicious. Yeah, so fire school, we don't go inside. Um, and we keep going, come rain or shine. I've got like a canvas sail that I put across the garden and a big umbrella that goes across this. And Come rain or shine or pandemic, in fact, because you can still, you've been having classes because it's outdoors and... Outside, yeah, we are, we're outside in the fresh air and it's um, yeah. you know, the joy, you know, people come here and they, um, and I can visibly see them relaxing because it's very stressful out there at the moment, isn't it? But, you know, we're all here and we're cooking and we're in the open and it feels very safe. Yeah. But adventurous at the same time you know it's been so it's been one of the best things about this summer is meeting a lot of lovely people and welcoming them into my garden and just sort of making them go away feeling a bit happier that's the, that's the right yeah so, so basically you should go on cooking outside all winter long just don't be put off keep cooking outside even when the weather gets colder you know just because you cook outside you don't need to eat it outside you take it in and um, and eat it on the sofa in front of a different sort of fire or you know you go and whatever you know I don't always eat outside but I like to cook outside I'm ready now because we're on 
time is marching on, isn't it? I'm just ready to kind of plate up one of these little stacks for you. Um, now you do plate things up beautifully, up. don't you? Because you, you, one of your jobs in the past was as a food stylist. Yeah. So, so did you meet him? Did you and meet I Ross? <laughs> I did, yeah. and I'm never gonna, never gonna live that down. I'm never gonna live that down. Only once. Only once. Only... <laughs> Do you know what? I I was too sort of um so I would put I'm just gonna put that there so I can tell this story properly. I'd made a load of massive pies. Well, that's your real really food. It wasn't like flour you know, pork pies. Pork pies and really kind of exquisite kind of banqueting food. And I was on set, we hadn't started filming, and I was just. <laughs> Some of them was a bit cheaty, but I was sort of titivating my pies and sort of arranging them. And he came up behind me and sort of looked <laughs> over me like this and said, Oh, my God, pies. And I just sort of went a bit weird wow. and didn't really say anything. So you could meet him, but I didn't really say anything because I was still sort of like overwhelmed by the whole thing. <laughs> Um, so what, I've done a little stack of four there of the squash. Um, mm. I'm just going to put some of that salsa on top, um, like that, and then that that kind of lovely yogurt, chili yogurt. I'm gonna, I generally put that just to the side because if you put it on top, it can sort of fall off. I love your setup. You've got kind of places and to then, put things I'm and balance it up there. Give it a little grind of pepper. That looks amazing. Actually, Margaret's still saying how lovely it is to have veggie options, not just chunks of meat and burgers and sausages. Right. So now, yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, like I said, I do eat meat, um, but this is more exciting to me. You know, it's you can with vegetable dishes you can layer up the kind of soft bits and the crunchy bits and the kind of zingy bits and you can create kind of infinitely more mm. kind of texture and exciting and i think that's probably why um lovely otolenghi is so popular because and there's nothing to stop you having a bit of steak on the side you know it's colorful and it's beautiful to look at and there's lots of textures and flavors going on and that's that's why it's great no, oh, of course, of course there isn't, and we often do. I mean, we've got two kids, and they're very carnivorous. Um, our son, in particular, would live off meat and bread. He's not interested in vegetables at all. Um, but yeah, we often do have a little bit of meat on the side. So then, the sweet corn is done. And I can show you. Whoop, let me show you that one. That looks pretty good too. Oh wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So pretty with its um with its husks on. And again, I'm just gonna balance that effect. Um I'm gonna chop up a tiny bit of mint. I'm just gonna roll that up so those other slices don't burn. Um I think this goes for kind of cooking inside or, or outside, you know, often I add something like fresh herbs just at the end because it wakes it back up again, you know, when you've spent that time kind of cooking it, you want to hit it with something zingy and fresh just at the end and it's just going to lift it and elevate it to the kind of next level. So yeah, there's the Amazing. Sweet. Um, Those so are absolutely base, incredible, Genevieve. And and thank you so, so much. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And goodbye, everybody. And thank you for watching. Bye. All right. Bye. Take care. See you soon.